morning and welcome to Phoenix Seventh-day Baptist Church. Today's service is going to be very different from what we have normally done in the past. It's, it's because of the circumstances that are existing all around us in our world that call for a biblical perspective and a response from God's word to what's happening. Last week, we prayed for people in the Middle East who were going through terrible experience of terrorism. And today we want to bring some biblical perspective to what's going on in the world. And so we are going to have only a message. And in the interest of time, we are leaving out some of the rest of the program so that after the message, you will get a chance to respond with questions, comments, discussion. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer as we enter into this study. Father in heaven, this morning as we come together to worship you and to study your word as a family, I pray that your spirit will be among us, that you will move in me and through your word as we look at the things that are happening in our world that are significant to us as we approach your coming. I pray that this day will be a day of enlightenment and inspiration and that we might enjoy good fellowship together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In Matthew 24, Jesus gives us the template, the template of eschatology. You know what eschatology is, right? Eschatology is the study of the end times. Jesus gives us a template in Matthew 24 of the end times. It was his last day of ministry, public ministry in Jerusalem as he left Jerusalem with his disciples and walked, for you it would be to the east, walked down from the city of Jerusalem, down into the Kidron Valley, and up on the Mount of Olives. And as they looked back over the city, they saw the temple and all of its glory because the sun was beating down on it in the afternoon. Jesus was on his way to Bethany, where he would spend the night. It says in verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What things? As they looked at the temple in all its beauty, Jesus said to them, I tell you, certainly, truly, surely, that the day will come when not one stone of that temple will be left upon another. And so their question to him was, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? When will these things be? These things that Jesus had just said would be, not one stone left upon another. When? And Jesus takes the rest, most of the rest of the chapter to tell them an answer, to give them an answer to their twofold question. When will one stone not be left upon another? And secondly, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Because they associated all of that into one question and they asked only one question. To them it was one question. And Jesus gave them a twofold answer just as the question was twofold. He actually takes them through in the next several verses, in the next many verses, tells them of two things that will take place. The destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world and his coming. The coming of Jesus Christ and the end of the world associated with it. Twofold, the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem and then his return and the end of the world. And so he says, 
He answers that question. When will these things be? How will we know? What will be the sign? And in verse 6 he says, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. Wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. And truly, throughout the ages, there have been wars and rumors of wars throughout the history, from the time of Jesus' statement all the way down until the present. There have been wars and rumors of wars. I can look back and, well, we can look back in history and see World War I. It was a world conflict, World War I. Then there was World War II, and there were others as well, the Korean War, Vietnam. The one that sticks in my mind is the Cuban Missile Crisis, because that was about the time that I was in my teens. President Kennedy was the president, and everybody was looking at the possibility of nuclear war with Russia, the two major powers of the world at that time, the America and Russia, Khrushchev and Kennedy. And there were wars that were accompanying that, little wars all over the world. But that was one that looked like it could blossom into. And every time there has been a war or a threat of war, the people of God's, their interest has peaked, wondering if this is the time when the end of the world might come, when this is the time that might usher in the return of Jesus Christ. Is that not true? Every time. People, Christians, pastors, my father preached that Jesus would be coming soon when I was 10 years old. Soon was not soon to me at that age when I now am in my 70s. No, that isn't soon to me. But the people of God have been watching and waiting and longing for the return of their Savior. And so every time something of national or world interest comes that along that, that makes them think that maybe this is the time, this is the event, these are the things that Jesus was referring to that would precede his return. Peoples, Christians, followers of Christ, their interest has been piqued by these events. And then there's, uh, how about 9-11? 9-11. That was the beginning of an era of terrorism as we were affected. We were affected as a nation by the events of 9-11, terribly. I still remember that day. We were living just a half an hour south of Washington, D.C., and three of the members of our church were actually at the Pentagon. They worked at the Pentagon. Three of our members actually were at the Pentagon when it was hit. And of course, New York and Pennsylvania. The terroristic attack upon our nation. That was significant. And that, in my mind, was the beginning of an era of terrorism in our world, for us especially, as a, as a nation. And so, then we went to war with Iraq and Afghanistan, Pakistan, we were over there, our troops. It was our war against terrorism. But what did Jesus say at the end of verse 6? You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. And then he goes, and then he goes into verses 7 and 8, where he says, read with me, follow along with me, Nation will rise. This is after he says, but the end is not yet. So now we are entering a new chapter in Jesus. This is a template. These are, this is a discourse of Jesus Christ telling us, telling us as his followers, all that is to come before his second return. The end of the chapter talks about his return. It describes his return in the clouds. But it spans 2,000 years. It's been 2,000 years. And so, he says, this is, the new, this is the next piece of the story. He says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these 
are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. In verse 6 he said, but the end is not yet. In verse 8 he says, these are the beginning of sorrows. In two weeks, when we return from the West Coast, where I have a memorial service next weekend, in two weeks, I want to look at a prophecy in Revelation that actually repeats what Jesus says in Matthew 24, verses 7 and 8. Those things in Revelation, which, which John uh, references as a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy here. What is his prophecy? Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine, pestilence, and earthquake in various places. And what does John say in Revelation? Sword, famine, pestilence. These are the beginning of sorrows. Jesus said, Jesus said that. So, what makes the war in the Middle East? Because that's what has triggered this message. That's what, this is something significant that's happening in our world. This is, this is uh, a worldwide conflict and it has terrorism written all over it that could actually affect us as well. There's something different about what's happening in our world today. I want to tell you a story, a true story, of, that took place um, out of Gloucester, Massachusetts in 1991. Gloucester, Massachusetts, 1991. There was a fishing fleet owned by a guy by the name of Bobby Stafford, and he had at least two fishing boats that I know of. One was called the Andrea a gale and the other one was called the Hannah Bowden. And I have read both books on both of those stories. The Hannah Bowden was the sister ship and the captain of the sister ship, Hannah Bowden, wrote a book on the account of the perfect storm of which the Andrea Gale was, the tragedy that took place in the Grand Banks, the area of Canada's Grand Banks in the Northern Sea as they were on a fishing trip. Billy Tyne was the captain of that ship, and he had come back with his crew. They, they caught swordfish. That's what, that, that's what their product was that they brought back from the sea, is swordfish. And they had come back a couple of times from a couple of excursions out on their fishing trips with very little catch. And as it got close to winter, when it would be treacherous to be out on the seas, it was starting to get to that point of the year when things were going to be treacherous out on the seas. But Bobby Stafford was disappointed in the work of his crew and bringing back good catches. It was affecting his business. It was affecting his, his, uh, the, the market for his fish. He, he was not able to supply and make the money. And so when they got back from their last trip, uh, in early September, he decided to send that ship out again. And so they went out on a risky fishing trip. And they went out as they went out to sea. They caught a little here, a little there. They weren't catching much. And so they went beyond the normal boundaries of their fishing area into the area of the Grand Banks into uh, Sable, Sable Island and beyond. And they were out there for 40 days fishing and they caught fish like crazy. They caught fish like crazy. And while they were out there with all of these fish that they had caught way out on the, on the Grand Banks, their, their ice machine broke down. And so these fish, they would be kept on ice until they would get them back to shore. And this was disastrous. And so they decided they would turn around and head back as quickly as they could. But there were storms brewing between them and Gloucester. Storms, not just one, but two. 
not just two, but three. It was, it was, there were two storms coming together in, in, a, in a convergence. Two storms coming together in a convergence between them and their home. But not only that, there was a hurricane developing that would come in between those two storms. And they just pressed on. They decided they were going to return. They were going to come back no matter what. And so they went through the first part of that storm, the first storm they went through. And as you know, in, in this particular case, this storm was a, was a churning, swirling of weather. And of course, in the, in the middle of that weather was what they call the eye of the storm. You've heard of that term, the eye of the storm. And they got through the first part of that storm. And they thought they had made it. And yet they didn't know that the worst was yet to come. That some of the waves that they encountered were 100 feet high. And the winds of over 100 miles an hour that they hit, they faced. It's a story of what we're experiencing right now. There is a convergence of storms that are taking place. Well, Billy Tyne and his crew never made it home. What's happening in our world right now is consuming my interest because we are in the perfect storm. We are experiencing a perfect storm. There are forces from one side and forces from another side and a hurricane in between. There is a convergence of storms that are brewing right now in our world. And I want to talk about that. What are the forces at play? Number one, there is moral decay. And you must say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Oh, it's very significant. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. There is moral decay in our nation, not only in the world, but our nation. Our nation used to be a Christian nation, but we are becoming an anti-Christian nation as we see anti-Christian sentiments becoming stronger and stronger and stronger in our country. There is lawlessness in our world. The Bible talked about lawlessness at the, at the end of time. Lawlessness. There's violence in the streets. There's violence in the streets. And it's even promoted by some of our, our government leaders. They're promoting violence in the streets. Go back to the days of all of the riots that we had not that long ago. Riots. Yes, riots. I, I won't call out organizations, but I know you know the organizations that were represented in those riots. And what did the government do? What did mayors do? What did, what did uh, leaders do in, in, uh, in the states and in Congress? What did they do? Nothing. Nothing until January 6th, and then that was a, that, they called that a riot when actually it was a conservative uh, movement toward just trying to reestablish our republic. I, that, that is a fiasco. That alone is one of the factors in our nation right now that shows how badly we are being led by anti-Christian, anti-constitutional, anti-republic uh, leaders in our nation. Yes, yes. People are in prison right now because they were just at the Capitol. I know a, a doctor, her name is Simone Gold, who was actually part of America's Frontline Doctor team that was providing alternatives for the vaccine during the time when there was vaccine mandates. She happened to be on the Capitol grounds the day of January 6th, and she went to jail. She went to prison. She served a short time in prison as a, as a doctor. She was also Jewish, by the way, interestingly enough. So there is lawlessness. How about the violence of, against children, sex trafficking of children, how about abortion? I'm not ashamed to stand up against the criminal act of abortion that is currently going on in our nation. Uh, 
these babies that they abort are alive and they are legally being murdered, legally being murdered through abortion. We have an anti-Christian culture right now in our world, in our nation. And, um, and so this is, one, uh, this is one area, the moral decay, gender identity and critical race theory being taught and promoted in schools. Religious compromise, evangelicals and Catholics, saying we all agree on justification by faith, the doctrine of justification by faith. They do not, but they, if they do, they are denying their roots as Protestants because there is a great difference between justification by faith as taught by the papacy, the Roman Church of Rome, and by the reformers of the Middle Ages great difference between the two and yet there's compromise people are coming together we need to be one we need to be one in Christ religious compromise and all of this is part of storm number one moral decay in our nation in our nation and why our nation because our nation is in Bible prophecy and we will study that someday Revelation 13 the last part is about our nation as it leads the world in, in apostasy against God just before Jesus comes. So, storm number one, moral decay in our nation. It's everywhere. National decay, storm number two, national decay. There's corruption in high places. In all branches of our government, there's corruption. All branches. From the presidency to the, to the legislative to the judicial, judges are ruling against a constitutional law in the courts today, the appeals court. There is. There's corruption in high places. Corruption, election fraud, impostures in power, yes. The demise of our constitutional republic, yes. And there's political chaos. Look at our Congress today. How long has it been? They, they just can't get together on a speaker for the House. And that's an important position for our nation, for our government to operate and to operate with strength. Why? Because there are the liberals and the conservatives and the rhinos, and they can't make it happen. There is weakness in our government. There is chaos in our government. And there is a political correctness that takes the place of conviction. We have no borders. Our country is allowing terrorists to enter our country. I fully expect, I'm not predicting, I'm not prophesying, I'm not a prophet up here this morning. I'm only, I'm looking at what the Bible says that we will actually talk about two weeks from today. And I'm looking at what's happening in our world. I'm saying this is all something that could lead up to exactly what the Bible has said will happen. Bloodshed. And it, I fully expect us to experience more terrorism in our nation. In our, lo in our nation. Terrorism from terrorist groups that are rising up, that are coming into our country. There's no, there's no closed door to evil coming into our nation. How about the dependence of our nation on enemy nations? We are dependent upon oil. We are dependent upon, you go to the store. I would say that at least 90% of all the clothing and the products in our markets and our stores are, is all made in China. And what is China but a communist country that is actually buying our nation, taking over the control of our nation. Yes, we are dependent upon enemy nations because of national decay. We are crumbling from the inside. We have a shell of national greatness. We have a flag that we, we honor. Our troops are fighting for liberty and to continue to give us liberty. We have a shell of of a republic. We have a, a pledge of allegiance that says we are a nation under God and we are a 
republic. It says, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the republic for which it stands. We are no longer a republic, not as a whole. There are people in our, our nation who are fighting and God bless them for their fight for against all of these things that we're talking about this morning. God bless them. But I want to tell you, I firmly believe that we have passed the point of no return to the country that we once knew, to the flag and its, and its principles, to the Constitution, the respect for our Constitution and our flag is crumbling from within. We are weak as a country, we are weak. And then you can add to all of that, all of the agenda of the World Economic Forum, which some of us have talked about before, and all that that is coming in to take over our monetary system, our freedom, our rights. The agenda of the World Economic Forum is moving quickly into our country to replace the principles upon which our nation was built. And so, What's happening in Israel is only the beginning of sorrows. It is not just a local war. It is a war that we, we have already sent uh, force groups to the region. We are being threatened by Iran that if we step into this fight that they will intervene. We're talking about major countries that have nuclear capabilities. Are you kidding? The war between Russia and Ukraine is nothing compared to what we are potentially about to face in our world. And many of the people in our country are protesting against our stand with Israel. Can you believe that? I can't believe it. Israel is our ally and Hamas is a terrorist group that controls the Gaza Strip and Iran is feeding that terrorism, supporting that terrorism, planning, helping them plan their attacks. Iran and Hezbollah. Oh, this is so huge. I can't tell you how huge it is because now it isn't just a localized war of one nation against another. It's, it involves the whole world and it is, it is greater than anything. This storm, I believe, is greater than anything that we have seen in the past. I believe that. So. We have passed the point of no return. No question in my mind. There is no going back to. We've passed the point of no return. Morally, politically, defensively. And the only solution to this problem is the solution of the Antichrist. I call it a solution. It's his solution. It's the solution of the Antichrist that is spoken of in Revelation 13. Yes, Revelation 13 is the, is the solution that will fill the vacuum that is being created by this empty shell of a nation. The Antichrist will be the solution and, and a, and a pseudo-Christian political entity here in our country that will cooperate with and promote Antichrist as the beginning of a series of events that are going to bring on the coming of Jesus Christ. We will talk about that too another day, but it is clear to me, the Bible is clear about what's happening and about what will come, what will follow in the future. So, I wanna open it up for discussion. Now anybody that has a comment or question they'd like to raise, please do so at this time. So Jesus made a comment, and if you didn't hear it, I'm going to repeat it, and also for our extended audience who will hear this next week. And that is that when Jesus said that there would be one stone not left upon another in the city of Jerusalem or the temple of Jerusalem, it's exactly what happened in AD 70 when Rome came in and torched the city, the temple, and I will just add to this, there was a lot of cedar also in that temple that caught fire. And the temple caught fire, and the, 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 uh, the gold that was in the temple melted, and the soldiers, the Roman soldiers came in, 
And the end of that battle in AD 70, not one stone was left upon another, just as Jesus had predicted. And that is the first question that Jesus answers. When will this be and what will be the sign of your coming? And the first part of that is what happened in AD in the first century. The last part is what happens in the last century. And that was a twofold question and Jesus gave a twofold answer. It happened once in Jerusalem. It'll happen again at the end of time. It'll be it'll be a it, it will it is a similar event but it happens in two places at two different times and the nature of it is a little different but we that's something we'll talk about thank you jay so the question that linda asked was is there are there any other christians that are that are offering advice or help in helping us as christians understand how to deal with what is taking place in our world and and in the event that uh, that China and the United States and, and all of these forces come together and create a dictatorship. Is there any answer to, those, to that possibility other than prayer? And my answer to that question is yes, read the Word of God. And the Word of God tells us exactly what's going to happen and what we just talked about, about our faith in God and our security in Christ is what's going to get us through. It's what's going to carry us through our trust in him. And it doesn't mean that we won't experience the effects of all of this that is taking place, but we will feel safe because we are his. And part of the solution is to talk about it, to get it out there so people are aware. Jesus said, watch and be ready. I'm trying to help us watch and be ready. The Bible is clear. Gary, Gary just brought up uh, an encounter he had with someone that he knew, uh, I guess somebody you worked with perhaps, who, uh, and, and the comment was made, have you noticed all this happening in our world today? And the, and the person that Gary was talking to said, I'm not worried about us. I'm worried about the nations that surround Israel. Because, and then he quoted the prophecy of Christ that's found in Luke 21, which is the parallel uh, ch chapter to Matthew 24, where Luke says that when you see the armies surrounding the temple, the Jerusalem, when you see the armies surrounding Jerusalem, then you will know that the end is near and coming. And so this person is feeling uh, unaffected to some degree simply because we're unthreatened at least because the Bible speaks of the army surrounding Israel not America not involving us and what I want to say is that is the first application of Jesus prophecy in Matthew 24 it is the first but it is not the last because as we look at Matthew 24 he does talk to the issue of of uh, Rome. He talks about Rome being, he doesn't say Rome particularly, he does, he talks about the abomination of desolation in verse 15 of that chapter, chapter 24, verse 15 of Matthew. He talks about the abomination of desolation. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, then you are to flee, for there will be a time of trouble such as never has been. And that is the first fulfillment of that prophecy. But it's not the only. It's like I said before, Matthew 24 is about what happened in the first century. It's what, about what happens in the last century. Because how does it end? It ends with the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. He sends his angels to gather the elect. The end of the chapter shows that it is a dual prophecy. It is a dual prophecy. What Jesus gives us, Luke concentrates on the first aspect of it. But Matthew 24 shows that it's a dual prophecy of what happens in the first century and what happens at the, in the last century as Jesus returns at the end of all of this. So that's what I have to say. Am I concerned about the nations that are surrounding Israel right now? I am concerned, but it's not going to stop there. That's my point. Because in Revelation 6, which we'll, talk, we'll re study in two weeks, in Revelation 6, 
it tells us that the rider of the red horse is given authority to take peace from the earth. And there will be bloodshed. And at the end of the red horse and the black horse and the dapple horse, those three horses in particular, it says that one fourth of the inhabitants of earth will die. That is a literal number. And Jesus said, this is the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of sorrows. So, yes, I am concerned. I am concerned. I expect, I expect this to become a bloody mess over in the Middle East. But I don't expect it to be isolated to the, to the Middle East. Like I said before, I fully expect, I'm not predicting and I'm not prophesying, I fully expect terrorism to rise in our own country too because our borders are not secure and they have detained a number of terrorist people who are on the terrorist list over uh, somewhere in the pro approaching 200. But how many have they missed that have come through? If you're a terrorist, you're not gonna get caught if at all possible. We have terrorists in our country right now. All they have to do is follow, follow through on what they are committed to and that is create terrorism in our nation. It's a clear warning to us that we are in danger. We cannot just look at the Middle East. That is only the beginning. That is only the start of something that is going to blossom into a whole, much, a whole lot more. So Ardeth made the comment. A lot of Christians don't like to study Revelation because, probably because they don't understand it. And that's exactly true. It's full of all kinds of symbolic images. There is understanding. Jesus said, I am telling you these things so that you will know that these things are about to take place in our world, he says. Right in the first chapter, I am showing you these things. Let me just give a hint to those who are studying Revelation, and let me just say this. This is a key to understanding Revelation. The first three chapters of Revelation are about Jesus, first of all, introducing Jesus in chapter 1. Chapter 2 and 3 are the message of God to the church of all ages. The seven churches. God's message to us as a church. They aren't limited just to the, to the localized churches in, uh, in Asia Minor at the time John wrote these letters. They were taken to the churches in Asia Minor. They are not just for the church of the first century, they are for us today. The composite message of the seven churches is for the church of today. The fourth and fifth chapters of Revelation are about what's happening in heaven during all that is about to take place in the last, the rest of the book of Revelation. What's taking place in heaven? Worthy is the Lamb. Who is worthy to open the seals that are, are being spoken of in Revelation 6. Who is worthy? The Lamb. The Lamb is the one. He's the one that shed his blood. Worthy is the Lamb. That's where that phrase comes from. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. From chapter 6 of Revelation all the way to the end, we have a lot of characters spoken of. A lot of, a lot of strange names given. The dragon, the beast, the two-horned beast, the seven-headed beast, the, the two witnesses, the harlot, Babylon, all of these, all of these names that are, are these characters that are talked about in the last, from six on to, the, to chapter 19 through 19, are all about, all about entities that are not identified except by this imagery that is given. The part, the second part I want you to hear is, is that what is said about these characters is literal. It's literal. All you have to do is, is find out from the Bible itself and, 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 and seeing how those terms are used and how they're identified in other places. All you have to do is understand who the characters are and now it's clear what they do. The role they play is literal. It's not symbolic. There's no hidden, there's nothing hidden. Like the two witnesses. 
The two witnesses. You know, who are the two witnesses? That the word of God as, as spoken by the servants of God at the, in the last days. The two witnesses are the law and the prophets. But they are, but they are expressed by the people that are chosen by God in the end, at the end of time to have a powerful message to a world that is in chaos. So it's, that's just an example. So revelation can be understood. Everything, no, some of it isn't going to be clear until we see it happening in our world. But there's enough that is so clear that we know who the players are and we know who, what their motives are and what their actions will be. So Sheila's comment was, these things that we're talking about this morning should not create fear in us. We should not be fearful. We should not be fearful. You're right, Sheila, we should not be fearful. We should be focusing upon our relationship with Christ, upon his word, and those things that will give us strength and courage, moral strength and courage, and make us fearless as Christians. And you're so right. But we should not be ignorant either of what is to come. For I would hate to be surprised. The Bible says that, that when Jesus comes, people will be building and planting, marrying and giving in marriage, just as if nothing was to happen. Just as it was in the days of Noah, when, he was, when, the, when the floods came upon the earth. And Noah was warning the world. God warns us. He says, watch and be ready. He doesn't say, you know, sit back and just kind of trust me through all of this. He says, watch and be ready. He wants us to know what's coming. He doesn't want us to be fearful. I totally agree with that. We should not be fearful. Why should we fear? Why should we fear? But we should know. We should know what's coming. And that I feel responsible to, to take this word that has been given to me and to us and present it to you in light of what's happening in our world and say, it's time for us to be watching what's happening and to be aware of what the Bible says is going to happen. If there were no need to know, God would never have given us the book of Revelation, ever. But the book of Revelation is there for a purpose, for knowledge and understanding not to build fear, because we serve Almighty God who has promised us to protect us and to stand with us through this time. Isaiah says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. Though you go through the waters, they shall not overcome you. Though you go through the fire, it shall not scorch you. For you are mine, and I will give nations for you, he says. I will give nations for you. David gives us Psalm 91, Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3. God is my refuge and strength. I will not fear. Though the earth be removed, and it will be, I will not fear. Though the heavens be cast into the sea. I will not fear, for God is my refuge and strength. So we must not fear. We need not fear. That's a better way of saying it. we need not fear, but we do need to know. And uh, and I'm and I'm I am preparing a series of messages that will help us understand what is on the horizon. So, anything else before we close this morning? Any other questions or comments? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this discussion this morning. Thank you for showing us those things which are to come. Thank you for giving us no reason to fear because we walk into this era of the final lap of time confident that you are our God and that we are safe in your, in your care. And we are safe for eternity because of your sacrifice for us, for your for your union with us that carries us from death to life and gives us living hope for eternity. I pray that you will
bless those who hear my voice this morning and bless each of us here present today. Give us your spirit within and your confidence within as we face tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen.